Well, they may be the, the new man quartet, but uh, they're certainly not novices. That's, uh, that's easy to tell. That was great, uh, guys, and we appreciate it. Well, I can't thank you enough uh, for the opportunity, uh, my wife and I being here, and we're grateful for that, and uh, it, we're honored and uh, humble uh, by your invitation uh, to come and be with you on this special missions emphasis day and especially with your uh, honoring uh, brother and sister Harrison and uh, we, we we appreciate that and thank you for your support of them I don't, I'm not sure how many years that you have but uh, we are grateful for that uh, churches working together is what allows missionaries to be able to go. Uh, I don't know that there's any church, any one church that could uh, do that by themselves. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it requires that there is that mutual effort and uh, you have partnered with them and we're grateful for that. And uh, they're a blessing to us. And again, I wanna thank you for allowing uh, me and my wife to be here with you and thank you for the uh, the accommodations you gave and the food. Uh, you know, it's rough preaching after you Amen. eat. Amen, eat at uh, 1 o'clock, 1.30, and then preach at 3. Uh, do y'all allow burping and, and all of that? I, I don't know what might come out, but uh, it sure was good, and we appreciate that. It's good to see Brother and Sister Thompson, and uh, it's been a good while since we've seen them. And... Uh, Brother Thompson and Sister Thompson, they're, uh, they're heroes in Virginia, and I'm sure a lot of other places as well. And uh, the Lord has used them to be an encouragement to a great number of preachers and churches, and it's good to see them again, and we appreciate that. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, there are just a few thoughts I want to give with you today or leave with you. And uh, trying to think about what I was going to say, what the Lord would have me to, uh, to give you um, in the context of this day, honoring uh, Larry and Cindy Harrison. And uh, this passage would normally be what you would hear at an ordination service. And probably uh, most ordination services, you'd hear somebody, uh, not uh, if they didn't preach from 2 Timothy 4, they would at least refer to it. Uh, during the course of that ordination. And uh, this, of course, is not an ordination today, but um, just a, a day to uh, recognize and commem commemorate and honor, uh, as uh, Brother Freeman said, uh, faithfulness. And uh, that's what Larry and Cindy have done. That's, uh, that's the, the example that they have set uh, in what the Lord has called them to do. So I want us to think along those lines and especially as we get down to one particular verse. But we'll start reading with verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we come in Jesus' name to you this evening, and we confess to you that uh, we certainly do need you as we open your word and as we handle the Word of God today, we pray that you'd help us not to mishandle it, help us not to uh, misunderstand it, misapply it. But I pray the Holy Spirit will uh, guide us uh, in everything that we say. 
And Lord, we thank you for the salvation that you've given us in Christ and thank you for the opportunity uh, to serve you. And I pray that we all uh, would be uh, challenged by the example, by the testimony of Brother and Sister Harrison. And Lord, we pray that uh, we too uh, might be found faithful and fulfilling uh, what you have uh, for us in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would use your word uh, to do the work that you would be pleased to do uh, in our hearts and lives today. So help us to honor and glorify Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You might have figured out that uh, we're going to look at verse 7, and really in particular one part of verse 7, but there are several things involved in this. He says, I have fought a good fight. And of course, this is Paul's testimony. And uh, I'm sure every Christian and uh, every preacher uh, would like to be able to say what Paul said when uh, they come down to the end of their days. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And Paul, of course, was about to die, and he knew that. He alludes to that, mentions that uh, directly in verse 6. He says, I'm now ready to be offered in the time of my departure is at hand. And he wasn't talking about going from one town to the next, departing in that sense. He's talking about leaving this earthly life and uh, entering into his heavenly life. Uh, departing this physical life and entering to that uh, eternal life in heaven. That's the departure that he's referring to there. And we're, we're not looking at it in that context this morning. As far as I know, uh, Brother and Sister Harrison are not... Uh, 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 you know, not ready to die. At least I hope that's not uh, true. Uh, they're, they're ready in, in the sense that they're ready to meet the Lord, but uh, we don't want them to go. And uh, they'd like to hang around a little bit longer, I'm sure, as well. So we're not talking about them dying uh, in that sense, but uh, I do want us to think about uh, Paul's testimony and, and make application of that when he says there in verse 7, I have finished my course. I want to be able to say that uh, when uh, you know I come to the end of my life, my ministry, whatever. Uh, I have finished my course. And in thinking about that, <clears throat> uh, you know, you you can't finish something that you don't start. And uh, in order to be able to say I have finished my course, you first of all have to start. And uh, I want us to think about the, the starting of it, and then the, the continuing of it, and then the finishing of it. Uh, Paul, I think, refers to his starting point back in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 12. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord, which was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And of course, we all know the testimony of the Apostle Paul when he got saved on the Damascus Road. Now, when you look at it from God's perspective, that didn't take God by surprise. God, uh, it wasn't news to God when Paul, uh, Saul at that time, in Acts chapter 9, when he uh, was saved. God knew all about that, but it was certainly new to Paul. And uh, that was a beginning point for Paul and uh, his life in Christ when he got saved on the Damascus Road. And uh, all of us have to have that starting point. And uh, we, uh, we, we cannot finish the course in our Christian life and first we, uh, until, first of all, we are established in uh, saving faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Receive Him as our personal Savior. And so Paul had that starting point by faith in Christ. And then he's continuing. Uh, it didn't end with Paul when he got saved. Uh, that was simply the beginning, wasn't it? 
And uh, we read much about the continuing aspect of uh, the Apostle Paul. You could do a study on the uh, life of the Apostle Paul, and, and much of that study would be focused upon uh, this continuing segment of his life. Uh, how he served God, how he uh, ministered, how he went from place to place and uh, did, uh, did the missionary work that we read about in the, in the book of Acts. And so uh, we must all continue. And uh, we, we, we start and, and then we continue to make progress. And uh, by God's grace, uh, we, we keep on continuing. Now, I'm not talking about we, we keep on keeping ourselves saved. Uh, no, God does that, doesn't He? Uh, God gives us eternal life. And uh, that, that's a gift, of course, through Him, through Christ. But uh, we, we are to continue the life that we have in Christ uh, here upon this earth, following the course that He sets before us, until he calls us home, uh, and we live in uh, we live in some strange days, don't we? Uh, I was talking, I think, with Brother Harrison earlier, and and, and things are different today in uh, in our culture, in, uh, in in churches, in religious circles. Well, we've seen a lot take place over the past few years, and if we're not careful, we'll be tempted to. Uh, think that just because something is popular and something is in the world's mind successful, that boy, that's the way we got to go. But uh, if we continue on the course that God sets us on, uh, that's going to be a constant course. And uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, uh, Paul gives us this, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I've often thought with all that we see going on today, uh, what, what are we supposed to do? You know, things changing all around us. And, uh, you know, I'm sure Brother Freeman would, would agree. Uh, pastoring becomes more and more challenging seemingly by the day. Uh, because of all the, the, the different difficulties and challenges and, and uh, problems that people face today. And uh, sometimes you wonder, well, what, what in the world am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to uh, deal with all of these things? And uh, the Lord spoke to my heart one day from verse 14 when I was wondering that. What, you know, how do we minister? What do we do today? And uh, the answer is... Continue thou in the things which thou... See, if we've learned uh, from the Bible, and we've been taught from the Bible, and we've been instructed and mentored from the Bible, that does not change, does it? Uh, the Word of God is constant. The Word of God is true. Uh, it, it stays the same. And so if the foundation of our lives ha has been established upon God's truth then what we're supposed to do is just continue on in the things which we have learned. And so we have that starting point when we get saved, and then from that point we continue on in learning of Christ, learning His Word, knowing more of Him. And, of course, the result of all of that is to be a life that is lived to the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. And... Sooner or later, if the Lord does not come, all of us are going to uh, come to a finishing stage of our lives. And uh, that, that's what Paul is referring to there in verse 7 when he says, I have finished my course. And I want to be able to say that. And uh, in the case of Larry and Cindy Harrison, I don't know. Uh, he, we were talking last night, I believe it was, at the meeting, and, and he said, uh, I'd love to go back to Mexico. Uh, and as uh, Brother Freeman mentioned this morning, it's clear that's where his heart is, or, or Brother Thompson, I believe. Heart is in Mexico. He said, God may allow them to go back to Mexico. Well, God can do that, can't he? 
Uh, we don't know uh, whether the Lord will allow that or not. But uh, uh, in just thinking about the possibility that, uh, you know, that, that work as they have known it uh, in Mexico for the past 20 years, that they're not able to, uh, to, to, to continue on in that aspect of the ministry, then uh, we could look at that in the sense that they have finished that course. They, they have uh, successfully and faithfully uh, walked that path of service that God has set before them, and now uh, they have uh, uh, come to the, uh, the finish line of that particular aspect. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying God is through with them, that God is done with them, that they can't serve God anymore. Uh, that's not it at all. But uh, perhaps, and again, God really is the only one that knows this, that aspect of it might be finished. And so let's think about that for just a few minutes, and uh, I'll, I'll try not to be long. And I've told our folks like uh, that before, and they've laughed and uh, made a joke about it. And, but I'm serious. I'll try not to be long with that. Uh, <clears throat> thinking back again about our starting point and uh, the details and the circumstances of our starting will vary from one individual to another. And what I mean by that, you know, we're, all, all of us that are saved, uh, we were saved in different places, uh, saved at different ages, uh, Brother Caleb said six, saved at six uh, years of age. I got saved when I was 18, got saved from different backgrounds. Uh, some were saved in vacation Bible school. Some would have been saved in a revival meeting. Some uh, would have been saved at a regular church service. Uh, some through a personal witness. Uh, someone witnessed to you and shared the gospel with you. Maybe reading a gospel tract. And uh, God uh, dealt with your heart, and uh, you got saved. And you could go on and on about the different circumstances. So those things would be different. They would vary. But we're all saved the same way. We all have that same starting point, and we get to that starting point with that life in Christ the same way. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Uh, only in Christ. Can we have that eternal life? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so we're all saved by the same, uh, uh, the, the, the same person, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that would be the, the constant in that. Uh, we, we get started on this course of life as a Christian many different uh, backgrounds and ways, but the same gospel uh, brings salvation to all. And then once we're saved, uh, the course that God sets before us will vary from one Christian to another. Not all of us, God puts on the same course. Uh, some will serve the Lord and, and their course will be being a faithful worker in a factory or maybe on a farm or in an office. Uh, a worker in a store, in a garage, maybe in a hospital, maybe in the military. Many places outside of what we would normally uh, refer to as full-time uh, uh, ministry. Uh, not everybody is called uh, to be a pastor or a preacher. Not everybody's called to be a missionary. But everybody is called and commanded by God to serve Him. And so this course that God sets us on, when we get saved, it may vary from one, uh, one person to the next. Uh, not all of us are called to be uh, uh, preachers, as I said. Uh, some will be called to devote themselves to full-time ministry. Uh, maybe a pastor or a, on a church staff or something like that, a Christian school teacher or an evangelist, missionary. Uh, but not, not everybody. And the course of some will mean that they are to stay at home and, and serve Christ faithfully uh, in their local church in, in comfortable and, 
and the familiar surroundings. Uh, others, that course may mean that uh, they'll, they'll serve God in places where they're not uh, familiar with the language. They'll have to learn a new language. They're not familiar with the culture. Everything about it will be strange. And uh, they're going to have to learn all of those things, uh, again, in, in unfamiliar settings. Uh, and what I'm trying to say is the course that God sets before us, uh, it, it, it'll be different from one person to the next. There, uh, uh, for some people, preachers, missionaries, their course may result in their becoming uh, well known among their peers. And they may, they may be uh, uh, called of God to, to preach to great ca- uh, crowds and, and, and vast audiences and so forth. Others, it may mean that they labor in obscurity in some village in Mexico or New Guinea or somewhere where uh, nobody outside their supporting churches and their family and so forth know them, know uh, what's happening and everything. They'll certainly never be invited to be the keynote speaker at any meeting anywhere. Does that mean that uh, they're a failure in their course? Not by any means. Uh, God uh, ordains that... uh, we, we follow the course of His choosing, and, and it is going to vary uh, from person to person. And while there may be many variables in that course, there are also some constants that make any difference whether we, we're serving God in Madison, Virginia, or Yorktown, Virginia, or Mexico, or New Guinea, or wherever. There are some things that are true Uh, uh, about our following God's course no matter where we are. One is this, everything that we do is to be done for God's glory. Everything. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And I believe that, uh, that reminds us as well of the mindset and the attitude that we have to have uh, in serving Him. And if we're going to fulfill uh, and finish the course that God sets before us, uh, we got to have the right attitude about ourselves. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26, uh, we read this, For ye see your calling, brethren, have that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, Not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Now, that does not make sense, humanly speaking, does it? Just another example that God's ways are not our our ways. His his thoughts are so far above us. You know... uh, Man may look at somebody and say, there's absolutely no way they're ever going to amount to anything. I thought that about David Gates. When David was a kid, I, 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 I wouldn't give you two cents for uh, his chances. But he got saved and God changed his life. And now he's used of God. And... Uh, God sees us for what He knows we can be. But wisely, He doesn't let us know all about that because uh, we'd have a tendency to get puffed up and think that we're something when we're nothing and to think that it's because of us uh, if God does please to use us. So God uh, chooses, God ordains these uh, base things of the world uh, things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And that is to be a constant attitude and mindset that we have as as God's people no matter where we're serving Him. It is to be for 
His glory. And it is all to be done according to His Word. And again, God's Word doesn't change, does it? It's still sufficient for what needs to be done uh, in the world today. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That is God's Word. That is what God's Word uh, will uh, do for us. And He's given His Word for uh, that work of the ministry. And as we uh, follow Him in following the course that He sets for our lives, it will be the Word of God that keeps us on that course and guard us and protect us from the detours and the pitfalls and uh, the, the traps that the devil uh, will certainly set for us. So uh, that, that's a constant thing. We all need the Word of God as we uh, travel down that course. And then that course is ultimately to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the verses that uh, God has used uh, to uh, help me particularly in uh, the past few years, Philippians 1 and verse 20 and 21, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You know, we're concerned about living, aren't we? And uh, we want to live. Sometimes you may hear the doctor say something to you that might bring the possibility of death uh, into your thinking. And uh, when that happens, you know, verses like that will be a great help to you. Uh, when you realize uh, what he says there, Christ shall be magnified in my body. And we got it all fixed up in, my, in our minds that uh, the best way for that to happen is for me to live. Not necessarily. Paul said... Uh, Christ be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And he's just expressing his desire there that whether he lives or whether he dies, his innermost desire is that Christ Jesus be magnified. And so... You know as well as I do, uh, uh, the course that God sets you on, it's going to have some bumpy places on it. It's going to have some rough places, uh, some trying places, difficult times. And uh, through all of that, uh, we should uh, uh, traverse that course in such a way that Christ is magnified in our lives. And all courses will ultimately lead us to the judgment seat of Christ. And that's a good thing to keep in mind, isn't it? One day we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul refers to that right here in our passage in 2 Timothy 4. In uh, verse 8 he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. And uh, part of that judgment, of course, that's a judgment of our works. And uh, part of that judgment is going to include, have I finished the course that God has set before me? Uh, it's not a matter of, of, of my choosing how I think I could best serve God. It's... Uh, finding the course that God has for me and then setting out on that course and by His grace finishing that course. And that brings us to what Paul says there in verse 7, I have finished my course. And that places Paul in good company, doesn't it? I say that because of John 4 and verse 34. 
say, Jesus said this, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And of course, we know he did that, didn't he? He finished what he came to do. And uh, this was a high priority for the Apostle Paul, finishing his course. Back in Acts chapter 20 and verse 22, he says this, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit uh, unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Keep in mind, Paul's course included bonds, afflictions, trouble. You can read about it uh, in his writings. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course, but, he says this, with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And so even though Paul knew that uh, uh, his course was going to include bonds and afflictions, he said, none of that moves me uh, because my priority is to finish my course with joy. And it should be the priority of every Christian to uh, finish their course. You can't finish somebody else's, can you? But you can finish yours. And we need to be able to finish that course with joy. And the course that God has had for Larry and Cindy Harrison uh, took them to Mexico. And uh, for the past 20 years, they've been faithfully serving Christ in Mexico. And uh, there are three uh, independent Baptist churches uh, that exist as we sit here this afternoon. Uh, there are three Baptist churches in, in Mexico that are there because Larry and Cindy Harrison uh, said, Lord, if this is what you would have us do, if this is your course for our lives, then we will go. <clears throat> I don't know whether he remembers it or not, but I remember... Uh, the time Larry came by the house. We didn't live far from one another, just right around the corner, really, in a little place called Pocosin. Uh And uh, Larry called, wanted to know if he could come by. And he came by the house, and we sat in, uh, in the same study uh, where I was studying and preparing for the message this afternoon. I thought about this the other day. Uh, and he shared with me what he believed God was uh, laying on his heart to go to Mexico. You remember that? And, uh, I mean, I didn't have any new revelation for him or anything like that. And it sounded to me like uh, he was already convinced that's what, that that's what God uh, had for their lives. And uh, they, they set out. They uh, made that known to the church, made that a public a commitment that uh, God had done that, and they took that step uh, of going on deputation by faith, and uh, they raised their support, went to Mexico, and uh, they've been there uh, for all of those years. And now, <clears throat> and again, uh, I want to emphasize, uh, God uh, certainly knows the end from the beginning, uh, but if things continue the way they are with uh, Brother Lair's help and so forth, then it could be that uh, that part of their course uh, that included Mexico, uh, that, that part may be finished. What, what, what they've been working uh, towards, working in, uh, working with uh, the Mexican uh, people there uh, for the past 20 years, that part... Uh, appears to be finished. And I'm convinced that Larry and Cindy uh, can say with the Apostle Paul, as he, as he put it here in verse 7, I have finished my course. And uh, that example uh, should be, and I believe is, a challenge to the rest of us uh, to fulfill our course. 
I thought of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our, of our faith. And they have run uh, that race with patience, uh, endurance, with faithfulness, the race that the Lord, the course that the Lord set before them, they have run that course faithfully, and uh, that part of it could be finished. Now, they have fulfilled, I read a verse a moment ago about where Paul said his desire was to fulfill the ministry that God had given him. And uh, they have faithfully done that. And that brings me to this question that I want to close. Um, you know, if they don't go to Mexico, uh, they, they're not able to go back to Mexico. Uh, does that mean that the work of the gospel is finished in Mexico? No. Does that mean God no longer cares about uh, Mexico? I asked Brother Larry if I could borrow his shoes. And uh, that's, did you wear these in Mexico? I didn't ask you that. Uh, what, what towns? Uh, Tabasco? Aguas? Aguas Calientes? Uh, serving the Lord there. And uh, there's nobody there now, at least where they were. Uh, who will step up? And uh, maybe God. Could there be someone here today, this afternoon? And uh, you would say, Lord, uh, I believe that's the course you'd have. I don't know. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I could not dictate that, would not attempt to dictate that to anybody. But uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't need any help from me, does he? Uh, there may be somebody here. Uh, God maybe stirring your heart just like he did theirs. And uh, all you need to do is say, Lord, here am I. Send me. I'll go. Uh, that may be the course that God would have for you and your life. Uh, would you make yourself available uh, to fulfill and finish the course that God has set before you. Let's bow for prayer, please. Father, we are grateful for this privilege of being involved in your work. Lord, we don't deserve that. And uh, we know that it is only because of the grace of God. And we're grateful for that. And we thank you for the testimony of Larry and Cindy Harrison and their faithfulness in serving you and Lord uh, their circumstance and their situation is beyond their control and uh, their heart would still be in Mexico is in Mexico and if you would let them go and return uh, there's no doubt they would and Father we pray that there would be others that would say, Here am I, Lord, send me. I pray that you'd help each one of us to realize the importance, uh, the necessity of not only making progress on this course that you've set before us, but Lord, by your grace, help us to finish. In Jesus' name we do pray. Pastor. Thank you, Brother Coffee. Brother Larry, could I get you to come forward just for a moment? Brother Larry Harris. You can look this way. We'll conclude the invitation here in just a moment. I'm going to get Brother Larry to do something. Yesterday, we had a Ask a Missionary time, and Brother Larry said something that's, that just stuck in my heart, and I think it would be good. I want you to, to uh, repeat what you said yesterday to our folks here. You, you made a statement, and I, I don't even know, it, 
the question that it was in response to, but you said that you felt like that every person ought to surrender themselves to missions. And, of course, that doesn't mean you're called. That doesn't mean God's going to call you to missions. It just means that when he does, you'd be willing. And uh, I'd like for you to, to tell that, and then we'll have our invitation. And that's what the invitation's going to be. If you've never surrendered yourself to God's will, most of all, but to missions. God, if you want me to, to, to go to the mission field, I'll go. That doesn't mean God's going to call you, but it doesn't mean he's not either. <laughs> Amen? It just means that if he does, you'll go. Are you willing to go if God calls you? See, I believe it begins there. So many people want God to do something with their life when they, when, when they won't even be obedient with what God's give them to do now. Why would God call you to do something else and you won't even be obedient to what he's called you to do already? You see? And so would you share that with us and then we'll, we'll close with that invitation. God bless you. Yeah, I was asked the question about uh, the call to the mission field. And I was uh, around 20, 22 years old when I surrendered my life to go to the mission field. Uh, God didn't call me then. Uh, it was the first mission, uh, Faith Promise Mission Conference I'd ever been in. Our church just, uh, had just started that. And the first one we ever been in, and we had a preacher from Australia that was, uh, was preaching. And the famous was that, have you surrendered? Now, the whole week. And, and, I, and I told him a story about, I always thought I'd be a missionary in Africa one day. It seemed like everybody came to our church was from going to Africa as missionaries at that time. And I'd go out and preach as a boy, as a teenager, to the trees, uh, thinking they was uh, people in, in Africa preaching to them. Uh, but uh, when they preached, when they uh, had that conference, uh, God spoke to my heart, and I come down and said, Lord, I want, uh, I want to surrender my life to go er anywhere you want to. And, uh, and I, uh, several people said, you want to buy a house? I said, no. Maybe God's going to call me to mission field. Uh, and God, I bought a house, just bought a house, and God called me to mission field. And he said, you love that house more than you do, uh, you do those folks in Mexico is where he was calling us to. And I said, no. A house is not important. I'm uh, 48 years old. I don't guess you're going to call me now. Uh, and, and, and I thought back, and I, and I never lost that. I thought back to that uh, when I kneeled and surrendered my life. And, and that stuck in my mind that God will never call anybody until they surrender. I had, we had the master's club there, and I had the preacher's boys in there and uh, his sons. And I remember uh, them saying, and they're not missionaries, but I remember them saying they surrendered to go to Missionville, and they want to go to Mexico one day. Uh, and I remember a lot of little kids there uh, in, uh, uh, in the church at Maranatha it, it said they wanted to go to the, uh, to the mission field. I looked at these young uh, guys over here, and they uh, took up the offering and working in the church. You're, you're not too young to surrender to go to the mission field. And I taught the older class this morning, and they're not too old to surrender to go to the mission field. We, I went to school with a guy that retired and came down to Mexico to start a church. You're not too young. You're not too old. Uh, and if you've got to take that first step. And I surrender. And God may never call you. Uh, and don't come and surrender your life and say, I, I'm going to surrender, but I sure hope you don't come. No. Surrender your life. I had the time. People say, well, preach your coffee. I don't know how you live down here, brother. <laughs> uh, he was ready to go home <laughs> two or three days after he got down there. And we loved it. We had the time of our lives. When God calls you to do something, he puts that within your heart. Amen. And nothing else matters. Amen. But the first and most important thing is that you've got to surrender your life to be a missionary to whatever God wants you to. Preacher Hall used to say, Brother Thompson, what is Brother Thompson? His uh, old buddy, Preacher, uh, Preacher Hall used to say, you take run off running for that wall and you uh, leave it up to God to put a hole uh, uh, to go through when you get there. So that first takeoff running is to surrender your life to go to the mission field uh, and, and uh, whatever God wants you to. But I, I think uh, people have the idea, you know, going to a foreign country, a foreign culture and all this, but it's, <laughs> I wouldn't trade it. I wish I could <laughs> I started younger, but God didn't call me <laughs> when, I, when I was younger. And so if you've never surrendered uh, to go, and I remember the part 
uh, the altar where I kneel there at Grace Baptist Church in Newport News, Virginia. I was assistant pastor there, still in Bible college, uh, and I surrendered to go to the mission field. I never lost that. Every, every presentation that I saw, I wanted to go to Mexico or go to that field. Uh, and, but it would go away in a few weeks. Uh, but in the next one, I'd want to go. I'd want to go. I'd want to go. So that first step is surrender uh, to go to the mission field. And if you'll do that, if you haven't done that, the preacher's going to give an invitation. It's time to, uh, to do that, just to come down. And here's my life, Lord. If you want me in Mexico, uh, I can give you some names and addresses. And folks will love you to death, love you probably more than folks here in America I will do if you go go to Mexico, but not necessarily Mexico. Don't worry about that right now. I worry about surrendering your life to Jesus, uh, to Jesus and let him uh, use you. Uh, you folks are important. Uh, you haven't been called to go to the mission field yet. <laughs> I'll put that word in there. But uh, you're just as important because uh, without you, we could have never gone to, uh, to, uh, to Mexico. All right. Thank you, Brother Larry. Let's stand to our feet. If you've never done that, I'm going to ask you to come and do that. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If God spoke to your heart, you've never surrendered your will to God's will, your life to God's will. If you've never surrendered, I'm going to ask you to come and kneel right down here at the altar. If you've never surrendered, would you come and kneel right here? Say, God, I'll surrender my life. I'll surrender my life. I'll surrender my life to your will. Whatever God calls you to do, wherever God sends you, whatever God tells you to do, you're willing to do that. You lay your life on the altar. What about it? If you've never done that, would you come? Would you come and do that? It's important. You say, what will people think? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people think. It's what does God desire. What is God's will? That's what matters. That's good. Amen. Someone else. Just come. Just step out from where you are. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be ashamed. You just step out and you come. That's good. Who else? Maybe you've done it. Once upon a time. You know, sometimes we can give things to God and take it back, can't we? We can tell God we'll do something and then we change. Maybe you've done that. You've gotten apprehensive about that. You have fear in your heart and doubt. But God has spoken to you. And you would be willing to come down to the altar and say, God, I submit and I yield myself afresh. I want to do your will. I surrender my life to your will. Would you do that? That's right. You just come. God speak to your heart. Be the greatest thing you've ever done. Then God will begin to bring clarity and direction. He'll make it very clear what he wants in your life. Perhaps he has in some of yours. And you have just deliberately disobeyed perhaps God has made it very clear to you and you have just deliberately gone in another direction and chosen to do it another way I implore you come seek God's forgiveness and ask him to redirect you and he will he will while these are praying, would you come? Would you? Don't wander through life aimlessly, folks. I pray that not one person in this building tonight, this evening, would wander aimlessly. No direction. No resolve. No commitment. You don't have to do that. God has a purpose. Life can have fulfillment, meaning when your life is doing God's will. Doesn't mean it won't be without 
sorrow, disappointment, failure. But it does mean in the midst of all of that, you can have a resolve and a peace that you are doing the will of God. I sure would like for some of you young people to get serious about this. Parents, teach your children by example to do God's will. Teach them. Quit asking them what they want to do with their life and teach them to yield to what God wants them to do with their life. Don't let a system, don't let a system, don't let an Egyptian system suck them in. Teach them to yield their lives to the will of God. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. How many years have been wasted through the Egyptian system of this world because people are chasing a dream instead of yielding to God's will. How often have I, and no doubt this pastor, how often have we seen it? Heartache. Disappointment. And it doesn't have to be that way. I'm going to ask Dr. Thompson to say a word, then he'll close us in prayer. Dr. Thompson, thank you for your steadfastness. You and Sister Thompson have certainly been a blessing to us. Would you say a word and then close our service and our day in prayer? Thank you, Brother Paul. I, I turned in my hymnal to number 308, and shortly afterwards, a pianist came and started playing the song. And I'd like for her to come back because she played this song, number 308, and I want you to turn there to it. This will be our closing prayer as we sing this together. We will sing this song if you are able to sing this song with truth, sincerity in your heart. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love
God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Well, it's been a great day. And I don't know too many churches, not just in America, but around the world, that could have heard the preaching that we heard today. Thank you, Brother Coffey. And I'm not sure that there's any. We heard great preaching this morning, tonight, great meal. I'm not sure there's any church around the world that could say, today we had a 91-year-old man lead us in a hymn. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for that. And I pray that each one of us would allow that song to speak to our heart. I surrender all. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. The good life is a surrendered life. I'm going to ask Brother and Sister Coffey, Brother and Sister Harrison, along with Brother and Sister Wilson, if you would, just to go to the back of the church. And as our folks are leaving and, and making their way out, they'll stop by and just visit with you and tell you thank you for being our guest today. Brother David Thompson, do you have anything before we dismiss? All right. We need some helping hands once we leave here to go over and help us out over at the um, fire hall to help take down. If you'd be willing to do that, that would be good. Go in and knock it out. We got it set up yesterday in probably less than 20 minutes. I think we could do the same. It's good to see Brother Carl here tonight and Graham. Good to see both of those men here. We had prayer for Sister Dobbins, and uh, she is back home resting. And uh, if the Lord be willing... We'll stop by and have prayer with her tonight and send her your love. Continue to pray, if you would, for Sister Dobbins. All right? God bless you. Have a great night. Have a great week. May the Lord bless you is our prayer.